I'm Milton Schlosser. I'm Nick Howells. And Milton, your role in this is? Uh, I'm the pianist uh, that performs uh, Crowfoot, and the piece was written for me. Yeah, and I I wrote Crowfoot, and um, yeah, it's been a collaboration, uh, us working together. Um, Well, Crowfoot started um, as, I guess, a way for... Uh, myself to explore some of my uh, history, my Métis background. And, uh, you know, that was the first, um, uh, the first initial conception of this piece was uh, uh, this uh, way to explore this background. And then it grew from there. Um, uh, The the very first, uh, when we worked, uh, when we first uh, came up with this idea, the very first um, thought I had was within the Royal Conservatory uh, music and um, uh, some of the earlier uh, children's books, uh, Bastion, Alfred, things like this. You usually get the the Indian dance or the Indian song, and um, uh, it usually starts off with the left hand doing an interval of fifth, uh, acting as the drums, and then a little melody on top. But then after that, that's about all you get for... Um, any mention of Aboriginal music, I suppose, within um, that tr- uh, tradition of teaching. And so I wanted to take that interval of fifth and do something a little bit more interesting uh, with it. And so that was the start of this piece. And then um, as I progressed in writing it, um, I spent a lot of time researching my background, uh, looking into my heritage, and finding ways of bringing that into the piece, um, and maybe making it a little more personal to myself. I started piano when I was nine years old, and uh, like any typical nine-year-old, I didn't want to practice, I just wanted to play with my friends, and so after about a year of study uh, with my uncle, Jim Howells, um, I decided I did not want to take piano anymore, and so I quit. Um, And it wasn't until I was 14, uh, my younger sister started taking piano, and I decided that maybe this was something that I wanted to do, and so I started again when I was 14, and... um, uh, started writing music as well and saw some su- success back then and um, that really helped take me uh, take it off actually I was in Edmonton uh, when I was 18 I think at the Kiwanis Festival and I'd won the um, composition competition for that and I think after that it was sort of my fate her <laughs> fate was sealed you know and um, um, yeah I've been composing since Nicholas came to study with me uh, at uh, the Augustana campus of the University of Alberta. Uh, He had done two years uh, at Red Deer College and then completed his degree at the University of Alberta in Camrose. And it was exciting right from the start because Nicholas was a very fine pianist, but I knew that he was also composing and he was just doing it on his own. It's something that he, he does. It's part of his creativity. He's also a talented visual artist. And uh, so one of the interesting things that I became aware of uh, in my relationship with Nick was the, of his Métis background and that, um, that it was something that potentially he was trying to work into his compositions. And so I mentioned to him that I live in the federal riding of Crowfoot, you know, named after the great uh, warrior chief um, that resided uh, sort of south of the Battle River, where Camrose is located, uh, part of the Blackfoot Nation, um, and was a major historical figure within Canadian history. But like most Canadians, we don't know that much about our history at times, unfortunately. So I've always had this idea of having a work that somehow incorporated uh, cameras, uh, the history of the area, and particularly something about Chief Crowfoot. And uh, so I mentioned this to Nicholas and also mentioned to him that uh, there is this wonderful quotation that uh, is taught in Canadian literature courses, which is a quotation that Chief Crowfoot uh, spoke uh, when he was dying. And it's very poignant, talks about life and its sort of fleetingness, uh, and is quite mystical. And uh, so 
Uh, that was an idea that I sort of pitched to Nicholas, and and then that's sort of how Crowfoot came about as a composition. He played with that idea. This isn't the uh, entire quote, but uh, it's the part that I used in uh, the composition, and it's, uh, What is life? Uh, it is the flash of a firefly in the night. It is the breath of a buffalo in the winter time. It is the little shadow which runs across the grass and loses itself in the sunset. And um, yeah, when Milton first presented that quote as an idea of maybe I could use this, I, um, you know, as soon as I read it, I thought, yes, you know, this is, uh, this really resonates with me. Um, you know, I spend a lot of time in the summertime in the mountains outside. Um, and for me, this quote, um, um, yeah, it just felt re really right for me. It's just sort of uh, um, felt really personal you know, something that reflected myself, so. I suppose in the piece, throughout the piece, the piece is somewhat sectional, um, and each of these sections does sort of reflect this quote um, and some of the images that are brought up by it. Um, you know, towards the end of the piece, you can almost hear what might sound like, um, you know, buffalo stampeding or stampede of buffalo. In other parts, it's um, a little bit more fragmented, um, you know, maybe like the flash of a firefly in the night. And um, in some parts, there's um, a little bit of work that Milton has to do with his voice. And, you know, that, um, to me, that uh, reflected on part of the quote where it's talking about the breath of the buffalo and um, just sort of this meditative... Um, moment, a uh, very peaceful moment uh, in the piece. Yeah. Crowfoot's an interesting work for me. Uh, it's not the first work that I've done that's incorporated uh, things other than just playing the piano. I did a recording in 1999 of a work by the noted American composer Frederick Chevsky called De Profundis, and in it I actually speak the text, uh, parts of the letter that Oscar Wilde wrote from prison. And I have to use my body as a percussion instrument. I imitate a tuba at one point. I play the piano, but I also speak text all throughout. It's a half hour, and it's, a, it's an extraordinary work in terms of contemporary piano music. So this piece, Crowfoot, uh, gets me doing something else, which is drumming with my foot. Um, and uh, so that, uh, I think the, the great thing for me is I'm also an organist, so I'm actually used to multitasking with my feet uh, beyond the pedals of just being a pianist. So I've been reflecting upon the fact, and when I perform this, people sort of think this is quite marvelous that I can do all of this, uh, but part of me recognizes that I've been doing rhythm with both of my feet for quite a while. So, um, but it's, this is certainly different. Uh, uh, what is also different for me uh, in this piece is that I speak Cree, and it's literally Hobima Cree. Um, Nick's uh, ancestors uh, came from the peace country and uh, spoke uh, at least a dialect of uh, Cree, beaver. Um, and uh, for this work, uh, the uh, wonderful quotation of Crowfoot is translated uh, into Hobima Cree, which is what I speak. Crowfoot himself was did not speak Cree. Uh, he was of the Blood Nation, and so it was, I think, a dialect of the Algonquin language. Uh, it's related to Cree distantly, um, but Nick wanted to put it into um, closer to the language of his ancestors and reflecting his Métis background. And uh, so... Um, yeah, it's it's a it's a work which is uh, one that I feel really comfortable performing in that it requires uh, the pianist to speak. Uh, I even uh, chant at one point, trying to make sort of uh, interesting harmonic sounds with my voice. Nick sort of stretches my boundaries, <laughs> uh, but th th they're good boundaries. Um, and and it's always interesting for me to perform works like this one because 
it, it transgresses a boundary. Uh, pianists aren't supposed to make noises in public. They're not supposed to grunt. They're not supposed to sing. Uh, and if they are, they're supposed to sing off pitch like Glenn Gould. Uh, here I actually have to sing on pitch. Um, but also, yeah, it's, 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 it's more like a performance piece, really. Um, and for a classical pianist, you know, I typically play Brahms and Beethoven, and uh, there's a, a tremendous freedom uh, that comes about in this. Um, and also something which is very unique to this work is Nick incorporates the aspect of community music making in Aboriginal music. So the audience is not just audience. At one point, they uh, participate, uh, they rustle their feet, um, imitating the sounds of a buffalo hunt. Yeah, the, the wonderful thing for me in writing this piece and working with Milton is that, um, you know, I, I've, uh, Milton being my teacher for, um, for the years I was in university, I've grown to know what he can do on the piano and what he enjoys doing. You know, I've heard um, him play the, the Chevsky pieces and some of these pieces that um, incorporate uh, unusual activities <laughs> while piano <laughs> music making and so for me that was a you know it's a great opportunity to be able to um use my imagination and bring in some of these different aspects of uh of playing uh which don't usually happen and so um and knowing that you know milton would enjoy at least i hope enjoy doing those things <laughs> such as playing drums and speaking and uh singing and yeah. Uh, this piece, uh, Crowfoot, is um, probably, I imagine, about the 10th or 12th piece that I've written over the years, um, although I do have a lot of stuff on the back burner um, and uh, stuff that's not completed yet. But um, definitely this is one of the... Um, it's a different piece than I've done before. Um, being young, listening to a lot of Chopin, Rachmaninoff, uh, some of my early, earlier music is definitely drawing in on that, those influences, those romantic influences. Um, uh, my, you know, pieces into my late teens and into 20s, um, definitely drawing on maybe more contemporary um, things I was listening to, Bartok, Stravinsky, and then definitely... Um, um, studying under Milton, being influenced by um, some of the um, really contemporary composers, Chevsky, um, you know, d definitely influenced this piece a lot in how, how it's composed. And so, um, yeah, this is a, it's a, it's different than what I've done before, but uh, I think it fits in nicely uh, with, um, I suppose, where I'm trying to take my music. Uh, yeah, um, my my heritage definitely influences my compositional style. I have written in the past a few other pieces that explore um, um, explore my heritage. Um, uh, one entitled Real, and uh, that was for piano, uh, viola, and cello, and uh, another piece just for piano. And um, I think this. Some of the aspects that would definitely influence my compositions uh, through my heritage would, um, with this piece, piece specifically, the idea of community. You know, I was asking myself, um, what would what would composition mean to me, or what would music mean to me if I was living, you know, two hundred years ago? And it'd very it'd be a very different thing. You know, it would not be um, maybe this. Uh, idea of performance or the performer, but uh, more this idea of um, bringing people together in community. Um, but definitely some of the other things that have influenced me, you know, listening to Cree music, um, uh, especially like uh, my, the most powerful one is the uh, uh, whistle song, and I, there's a, lots of different versions of that, but very strong rhythmic, uh, you know, rhythm, rhythm, rhythm in the drums, and um, um, 
crazy vocals <laughs> that uh, you know they're very high pitched and they um, you know they just move from one end to the other uh, of the vocal range and uh, you know this intensity that I'm hearing in the Cree music that I'm listening to um, definitely is influencing some of the things that I'm trying to do on the piano. I think um, you know this this piece. Uh, to me is special and I've uh, incorporated in the drums and all these different elements um, you know I think the I think in a way this does uh, expand um, my understanding of what I can do with music uh, and how I can approach music um, you know will I write more pieces with drums I'm not sure uh, it depends on if I can find <laughs> other people willing to <laughs> uh, willing to play drums but uh, um, definitely you know o opening up um, bringing in maybe other musicians and other instruments such as drums and maybe uh, you know I'd love to uh, write some music incorporating um, Cree singers and drummers and then bringing in sort of the western uh, style of classical music and trying to merge those um, which you know would be a reflection I think of my life um, being Métis. Mm -hmm. I think one of the pleasures of playing a contemporary uh, piano piece like Crowfoot is that uh it, it takes you back to actually how music was. If you thought, you know, about what it was like to play a Mozart sonata when Mozart was alive, and there would be thrills and spills, and there wouldn't be the huge tradition that you had to get it right the first time. Well, you wouldn't get it right the first time anyway. And I think classical pianists, if they're honest, will say, even with the great, the great composers, the great white male composers, uh, you know, the first time around you're growing. And I'm, you know, I'm now in my early 50s. Uh, I'm coming back to pieces that I played when I was 21, like in traditional repertoire. I'm very different. And it makes me realize that, you know, as an artist, it is a lifetime of growth. Some of my mentors are people like Claudio Rao, who are playing uh, the piano into their 80s and taking slower tempos than ever mm -hmm. and, and creating a, a very different sense uh, of themselves and but also, you know, exhibiting a lot of wisdom. Uh, one of the things I've noticed about playing Crowfoot, which I've played now, I think, in public at least six times in recitals, is that uh, every time it does grow and my intimacy, my, my sense of knowledge of the piece is growing and, uh, and also my sense of confidence with the piece. Um, we, uh, I premiered it uh, in the fall in Camrose, but then within two days was playing it at a provincial conference of piano teachers, a hundred strong, uh, the Alberta Piano Teacher Association. And Nick just happened to be there as well, not just happened, I <laughs> dragged him there. Um, and it was quite exciting because Nick spoke at the conference um, and gave a very personal sense of what this was, piece was about before I performed it. Um, and the response was very positive. Uh, and people really got it that this was a young Aboriginal artistic voice in a type of music, classical, that has very few Aboriginal voices in it in Canada. Um, and so the way that he sort of incorporated his heritage, the, the musical elements that reflect his identity as a Métis person uh, were quite exciting. Then the next step was playing it uh, at the Canadian Embassy in Tokyo in November. You should have dragged me along for that. Hey? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Sorry, Nick. Um, and what was very cool about that was that the Alberta government's Japan Trade Office uh, signed on to this project with great zeal and promoted the concert along with the Canadian Embassy. And so we ended up, uh, uh, I was there with my uh, colleague at the Augustana campus, uh, soprano Kathleen Corcoran. You know, we presented a, a recital of Canadian music, so it was songs by Canadian composers, but it also included this solo piano piece, Crowfoot. Um, the audience reaction was was fantastic. And uh, so we had a full house of over 200 people, uh, mostly Japanese citizens, uh, who afterwards came up and marveled at this piece. They, of course, had not seen somebody play a foot drum and the piano and speak Cree. And, and it was this incredible, I think, sense of revelation to them about 
Canada and the sorts of things that are going on in Canada. And, uh, and since then, I, I just have uh, finished a series of recitals, including one in Vancouver, um, you know, where I've performed it. And, you know, my sense of the piece is growing and, and also the sense of the power and of how it uh, connects with audience members. With contemporary music in classical, you sometimes worry that there is a disconnect. But I think with this work, um, it's accessible, much like the music of Frederick Chevsky, the American composer who I've recorded uh, at least a couple times. Um, one of the things about his style of music is that it is very challenging. It's full of dissonance. It's full of the thrills and spills and, uh, and it's virtuosic, but there's always something that engages an audience. And with him, it's, it's social issues. And sometimes it's even throwing a bit of jazz, uh, or very, very tonal stylings within it, uh, and Nick's music has the same sensibility. Uh, Nick actually met Frederick Chevsky. Uh, Frederick uh, was brought to the University of Alberta one year, and Nick had a little sit-down coffee with him. Uh, mm -hmm. Nick was performing one of his works at that point. So, so Nick is very familiar with the music of Frederick Chevsky um, and has met him as a composer. And it's sort of built up, I think, a different type of vocabulary um, for Nick, which I find very attractive as a pianist. Not all contemporary piano music is what I would call inherently pianistic. Um, but with Nick being a pianist and with Nick having um, played and performed works by, uh, you know, one of the greats uh, today in terms of piano composer and pianist Frederick Chevsky, uh, he's developed a sense of how to create uh, a language which is both contemporary but accessible. Oh, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm very happy with this piece. Um, you know, often when I'm composing, um, you know, I imagine this happens with most people, um, you know, you find some inspiration. So, you know, definitely Milton uh, suggest, sh suggesting the quote from uh, uh, Chief Crowfoot. And then, um, you know, the ideas start flowing. And often what happens for me is um, the first thing is usually th um, the overall structure of the piece, um, you know, sort of where I'm, where I want to take it, where I want to start and then where I want to go to. And that's, uh, you know, it can be a little bit vague sometimes, but um, usually in my head, I, you know, I'm, see this whole thing in my head uh, or this whole piece of music in my head and then the process starts and um, you know things change as you go um, you get inspired by other um, you know other th other things that influence you um, or maybe you some of the things in your head that you thought would work uh, end up maybe not being as um, powerful maybe as you thought and so um, as I'm going through the process, I'm, you know, I'm constantly going back to what I've written or, um, you know, moving forward to parts that I haven't written yet and maybe inserting material and uh, adjusting. And, um, you know, the, for me, the initial writing process is quite quick. And then it's, um, their perfectionist comes in after that and starts nitpicking and, um, um, going through the whole piece and, um, yeah, just making everything exactly how I want it. Anyhow, um, you know, in the f piece, when I finally, um, took my, uh, the handwriting and, uh, put it, input it into notation and got it printed off, um, at that point it's, you know, it's sort of, I guess it's not written in stone, but it's pretty close because you're sending it off to, you know, I was sending it off to Milton and you uh, start to wonder, you know, have I done everything exactly like I want to? And then, of course, the other thing is, um, especially with a contemporary piece, you don't always know how a performer is going to um, uh, interpret it. And so, um, yeah, it's, it's a little scary, you know, you're... Uh, taking this thing that you've worked on and then giving it away and hoping that it goes well. Anyhow, um, when I heard Milton first uh, run through this with me and, um, you know, he, I went up to Camrose and uh, we worked on it a little bit together and I was, um, 
I was happily surprised that um, what I had written down, you know, for the most part, he had interpreted like I had thought that it would or should be played. And so for me personally, that's, um, uh, that's a really good feeling, knowing that what I've done um, is correct. You know, if someone else can pick it up and, and play it as I've, you know, dreamed it in my head. And... Um, and yeah, you know, the finished product with Milton playing, um, uh, it's quite a, quite amazing feeling to, um, you know, to plugging away in my, in my house on my upright piano where the sound's not too good. The piano's on a tune. Um, you know, my drum won't fit under the piano. So I, you know, I'm sort of drumming behind me while I'm playing and, and not really having the idea in your head, but not really being able to express it as you want to and then taking that piece and giving it to Milton and all of a sudden you know it just comes alive and uh, that's a very powerful feeling Um, uh, it's a very good feeling